thought I was the only one. So if I wasn't telling and it, I was the only one, then nothing was going to come out. Sixty people, the youngest, aged eight, was sexually assaulted by Savile at Stoke Mandeville Hospital. I do believe he targeted me, and he was just biding his time. Prince of Wales and Princess Diana came to open the unit, and I went back for that. And he was there, but I didn't speak to him. For Jimmy Savile, it was a moment of triumph. Prince Charles was supposed to come alone, but when Princess Diana turned up as well, the patients, neatly lined up in their wheelchairs, were overjoyed. I didn't go back to the hospital after that. It felt as if I'd lost all my friends, as well as being raped. At times, Prince Charles had to compete with the flamboyant Mr. Savile for the attention of patients. How on earth do you raise ten million pounds in three years? <laughs> Throughout 1983, Mrs. Thatcher pressed for a knighthood for Savile. But rumours and Savile's open boasts in the press about his sex life while raising money for charity were alarming the Honours Committee. Mr. Savile wrote the chairman, might not be able to refrain from exploiting a knighthood in a way which brought the honor system into disrepute. Savile was down, but a long way from out. Savile's campaign for a knighthood was boosted when the government appointed him in 1987 to a task force running Broadmoor, the high security psychiatric hospital housing many of Britain's most notorious murderers and captured here with serial killer Peter Sutcliffe. A nice letter from the, uh, the minister himself thanking the task force team and uh, myself for doing it. Savile allowed a television camera in, showing how he was fixing it for Broadmoor. We are a great listening hospital. We listen to people. I listen to nurses, I listen to doctors, I listen to porters, I listen to drivers, I listen to everybody. We've turned into a great listening hospital. I'm Naomi Stanley, and I did blow the whistle on Jimmy Savile many years ago, and nothing was done. I was in a new job, having qualified as a psychiatric nurse. I learned um, about what he was doing from patients who had arrived uh, to the hospital I was working in from Broadmoor. What I was surprised at was the extent to which he was embedded in Broadmoor Hospital. He actually had a house in the grounds of Broadmoor that he had keys to all the wards in all the units and did move about freely. A young woman had disclosed to me what had been going on and that he had sexual relationships with uh, many of the young women there and at the time there were very young women there, 16 and I believe 15 as well. It was just accepted on that unit that young women would be used to provide sexual services to him. Staff and residents knew what was going on. And this was continuing for years. She was going to report him. She said she was going to go right to the top. And apparently, I remember this specifically, she said that Jimmy Savile laughed in her face when she said that. He commanded a lot of authority in Broadmoor Hospital and could do and act as he pleased. He was officially referred to as Dr. Savile and allowed to watch female patients undergo strip searches and take baths. I spoke to the charge nurse. I told him what was going on at Broadmoor and he was just 
irritated, flustered. Um, his attitude was, you know, what are you doing, you know, causing me these problems? I don't want to have to deal with this. I received the message to keep my mouth shut. You do not criticize anybody who's your superior. The fact that he had his own keys and could move about freely really emphasized that he really was in with the management of the hospital. It's the worst kind of collaboration. 11 people, three of them children, were sexually abused by Savile at Broadmoor, some repeatedly as a result of his unlimited access. Despite the growing questions, Savile was closing in on his knighthood. His charity work had endeared him to the royal family. Prince Charles referred to Savile as his health advisor, and he'd even helped Charles and Diana through a particularly tough period of their marriage. In June 1990, aged 63, Savile's wish came true. The TV presenter and disc jockey Jimmy Savile has received a knighthood in the Queen's birthday honors. In recognition of his charitable services, Sir Jimmy was knighted by Her Majesty at Buckingham Palace this afternoon. Today, though, Sir James was concentrating on the business of joining the ranks of the titled. It's an experience he clearly enjoyed. Sir James has raised millions of pounds for charity in marathon runs and other stunts. His favourite good causes include Broadmoor and Stoke Mandeville hospitals. And I said, my mother and father are here, and she said, are they? And I said, well, not actually here, they're in heaven, but they're here because I've got my mother's wedding ring on, my father's wedding ring on, and she said, ah, how very lovely. I can remember those pictures so vividly on the telly, how smug he was. And I thought, my God, he's even taken in the royal family and the queen. Savile's verdict? It was a ginormous relief when I got the knighthood because it got me off the hook. Sir James Savile OB. Correct, yes. Is Good he evening. here? Is he here? Yes. He is indeed. Right. Five years later, Savile's life story was examined on TV. His full range of evasions and distractions were on display. What surprised me when I met him was how confident he was. He knew we'd probably be probing in areas that he would rather we didn't. We did think his behavior was very strange. We did suspect uh, of inappropriate relations with teenagers and young uh, girls. Have you had lots of female I would hope so, because being alive a long time, I would have hoped that one would have had lots and lots of them. But. Uh, uh, but I've got remember? this terrible... Me oh, unfortunately, no, you see. I I've got this... And anyway, I'm not... I never have been a grass. And a gentleman never grasses on ladies as ever... But we're not asking for names. We're oh. just asking for the general principle. Oh, so, I mean... He took out the banana know. and started peeling the banana. That immediately moved people's attention from my questions and his lack of a response to them to the peeling of a banana on air on television. We just I mean, want to know if you live this sort well, of playboy say... life of the DJ. Yeah, give or take, a uh, few nice ladies. <laughs> and the audience chuckled and laughed, and they thought, oh, this is Jimmy Savile, what a great character. Why is that miserable, po-faced journalist asking all these unnecessary questions uh, about our lovely Jimmy? Have relationships and sex been hey? casual? <laughs> is that a casual matter you, for you? You mentioned the S word. <laughs> and it worked. It worked. He thought the shield around him, protecting him from proper investigation, was impregnable. I told you I was boring. <laughs> but is, is it just a facade? Or the, the, yes. the, the play-by image? Yes. Yes, or I'm that, very... Or is that answer part of the facade? No, no. <laughs> you, can't, you can't win here. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't break it. And that it wasn't really a risk to put himself in front of somebody like me. And you know what? He proved to be right that shield was pretty much unbreakable to his dying days. For 40 years, Savile's crimes had remained covered up. But in the mid-1990s, 
two women, former Duncroft pupils, were prepared to speak out and a newspaper was ready to publish. I was editor of the Sunday Mirror and the two women really wanted the truth about Jimmy Savile being exposed. Savile would take them out, sometimes together, sometimes separately, in his Rolls Royce, other times in a van of some sort. They would take into the woods. One of them said there was full intercourse. The other one told us that he got her to give him oral sex. It would have been an explosive, explosive story. Jimmy Savile would have been finished. But then the women became nervous. They were intimidated by Savile, who'd warned them that they would ever believe them and he'd make trouble for them if they ever talked about it. One of them said, who's going to believe us, a couple of ex-approved school girls, when Jimmy Savile is a friend of Princess Diana and Prince Charles, a friend of Margaret Thatcher, and had even been knighted, which was the thing that outraged her most of all. That sickened her. She kept cuttings from the year 1990, and she would stick pins in Savile's eyes on the, on the photograph. She lost her nerve, and the other one also lost her nerve. I did alert a high-ranking police officer in the top four or five roles at Scotland Yard, and the feedback I got was that girls from troubled backgrounds like this making accusations against celebrities were in a no-win situation. So basically, they didn't want to know. In 2009, Surrey police detectives did interview Sir Jimmy Savile, now aged 82, about separate allegations by girls from Duncroft. But he would only agree to meet at his office in Stoke Mandeville Hospital. What I've got here is really the only substantial police interview with James Wilson Savile, as it calls him here, in his entire life. And this was in 2009. All those years and all the things that he'd done that emerged later, he'd only ever really undergone one serious police interview. They put the point about the rumours, sexual relations with children, and Savile dismisses these allegations, saying, I've had five people make allegations that I did something because I take them to court, I sue them, they've made allegations, and not one of them wanted to finish up in court with me, so they all settled out of court. Savile sort of tries to explain away allegations against him by basically saying, ah, oh, people are just out to cause trouble, to blackmail me. And he says, that's why I've got this group of friends. So back referring to his old Friday morning club in Leeds, including some, quite a few senior policemen, and they deal with any problems. I give them my weirdo letters, pretty much telling these coppers from Surrey that he's got very influential police friends in Yorkshire and uh, these Surrey boys really ought to mind their own business. That's the Savile I remember, the arrogant, intimidating Savile, the litigious Savile who, if you ever got anywhere close to him, threatened legal action or threatened his friends on high would come down on you like a ton of bricks. That's Jimmy Savile I remember. Sir Jimmy Savile, one of the most colourful figures in popular entertainment over the past 50 years, has died. He was 84. He was paraded through the streets in that obnoxious casket. I was horrified at the pomp and ceremony. It was, you know, gold coffin, streets lined with people. It was, it was obscene his own charitable trust, and colleagues from Stoke Mandeville Hospital, Leeds General Infirmary, and Broadmoor. This selfless saint, Saint Jimmy, you know, that's not really who he is. He's a pervert, is what he is. Just made me smile that he was finally dead. Weird to think how many other people must have watched that and thought, yeah, thank God for that.
but it would be another 12 months before the terrible secrets emerged. Now, for the first time, we explore the other side of Jimmy Savile. An ITV exposure documentary broadcast sensational claims from women that, as girls, they were raped and assaulted by Jimmy Savile. She also claims Savile went on to abuse her at BBC Television Centre. Savile would invite Duncroft girls to be among the audience who used to sit on beanbags on a set of Clunk Click. Overnight, the sainted figure had become the embodiment of evil. At Leeds General Infirmary, they're now mounting an investigation into who knew when what When one 11-year-old with cancer screamed as he assaulted her, she was told by a nurse to be quiet. All that it takes for evil to prevail is for good people to do nothing. And that happened time, time, time again. The Metropolitan Police found that across more than 50 years, 450 people had been sexually abused by Jimmy Savile, 328 of them children. The unmasking of Savile changed the way people viewed celebrity. From now on, fame was no bar to guilt, and a host of high-profile cases followed. My goodness gracious. Today, one of the law firms central to the Jimmy Savile case said more complaints have been made against Rolf Harris since the verdict yesterday. Freddie Starr groped her when she was 14 in Savile's BBC dressing room. This isn't the first time he's been convicted of sexual offences. The former glam rock star known to millions as Gary Glitter. Ten years since the death of Jimmy Savile, and 17 separate inquiries costing at least 200 million pounds. Many who knew the truth say change is needed to stop the same thing happening again. If Broadmoor staff ever considered blowing the whistle on Jimmy Savile, they knew that they were gonna have to walk out. Probably they're gonna have to walk out, take their families with them, leave the house that, they're, that was tied in with the job leave the institution, that they're, they're going to lose their social life because people will turn on them. Everybody was cliqued together. We really need to look at what happens in institutions and why people behave like this. Otherwise, it will just happen again and again and again. It's still not a crime not to report child abuse. It's still easier for an institution to hide it, whether it's a school, whether it's a church, whether it's a national broadcaster, than to report it and make sure that the police and the authorities investigate. And I think that's a lesson we can learn from it, that we can make that change, bring in a law that says you have to report child abuse. If it did happen again, I think that people these days would probably speak out and they wouldn't be as timid as we were back 40 years ago. For some, the ghost of this brazen and grotesque man remains and will continue to haunt the nation he groomed. I think everybody was surprised by the scale and the extent and how hidden it had remained for all these years. And I hope too people felt a little bit ashamed that they had elevated this man of no talent whatsoever, weird and slightly sinister, to the position of a national icon, a national treasure, whereas in fact he should have been spending most of his life in jail. I think it's a, in some ways it's a parable for the bad side, the embarrassing side of modern Britain. I tell lies when it suits me. <laughs>